After eight years of painting, I decided I would like to see if I could do a textile again. I had the idea in my head I'd like to do a portrait using some of the techniques that I had learnt with painting and see if I could take those to embroidery. So I decided I would try and do a portrait of my daughters. At the time, they'd both actually left home, so I basically tried to piece together a drawing from different photographs I had. This is roughly what I came up with. This is not exactly the same as any of the photographs. I improvised quite a bit with this. And I started by working on the faces. I tried this time to do hand embroidery on the eyes and the nose and the mouth. But then I put directional lines in to try and work out where the machine embroidery was going to go. The first face I attempted to was my older daughter Jade's face. This is not the original face. The first face turned out to be a complete disaster and I had to do it completely again. This was the original face. It's slightly lopsided, the mouth, it just in the eyes, they're not quite straight together. They started off straight, but when I was embroidering into it, it got quite warped. In the end, when the nose was too big, the mouth was too small, the eyes didn't look good. And I thought for a long time, that's what was I going to do? I couldn't do a whole piece of work when the, the focal point was a disaster. So I cut the whole face out. And I did a second face. I had to insert it into the piece of work and then embroider around. As you can see, this is where the face looks really distorted. It's gone completely out of shape. And I've drawn a fine chalk blue line around the head. Not very easy to see, but that was my line ready for cutting. This is a new face in progress. I've done some hand embroidery on the eyes, the nose and the mouth and I'm starting my directional lines for doing the face there. I've put felt behind the face itself so that makes it good for working but behind the hairline there is no felt and the reason for that is then it's thin enough to then when inserted into the hole cover the hairline and that is where I embroider over which holds the whole thing back together. In this picture you can see where I've used that blue line to cut away that felt around the edges and that should be the exact shape to slot into the hole and the silk around the outside where I've drawn the hair is ready for sewing over so that it slots in and looks like it's all never been cut out in the first place. The face is inserted here. The silk that's going to be used to attach is round the edges over the original hair and is pinned first and then it's tacked down. As you can see here, I've had to sew it into the back as well by hand so it's very secure and will never be a weak part of the piece of work. The hair was then worked back in and not long after that she cut a new fringe so again I had to change the hair and create a fringe which she only had for about a year and then she grew it back out again so it's probably the only time she ever had a fringe. Finally they took pity on me and came home and allowed me to take some decent photographs. I then could try and sort out the faces and get them right. Jade did cut her hair quite a lot shorter in this picture that she gave me. I couldn't change the length of the hair but uh, the fringe was put in. It was quite a struggle to get the faces right but I did actually learn an awful lot doing that and I haven't had the same problems again doing a face. I understand much more about how to achieve it. I like to try and work out from the centre outwards because by doing this, by going round and round, it's from like a big circle going outwards. You're less likely to have a problem with it warping. I went on to do the blouses that they or the t-shirts they were wearing. I've added in a bit of detail to the neckline here to just make it more interesting and it just made them different to look at. And the t-shirts are kind of made up and this is where I've used some of the techniques that I've learned where I use my shadows first so I build those up first and then I go on to do the highlights and after that I work on the shades in between and this is how I've been taught to paint and I've found it work quite well with textile. 
The jeans were quite a challenge. I wasn't sure how I was going to do them, so I got a piece of denim and sat looking at it, thinking how on earth I'm going to make a piece of textile embroidery look like a pair of jeans. And in the end, I tried weaving it by sewing in one direction with one colour and then in another direction with another colour to create the effect of denim. I broke an awful lot of needles doing it because obviously by the time I'd gone over it in so many different directions in different colours and then added highlights, it was actually very, very thick and I did go through quite a few of needles. My older daughter Jade wasn't very happy with the way her thighs looked at the end of it and she complained and said I had to thin them down. She thought it made her thighs look very fat. And my younger daughter, she wasn't very happy with the jeans that she was in because the photograph that I'd used to draw her from, she'd had flare trousers and of course they were quite old fashioned so she insisted I put her in something less old fashioned so I had to change those. This was the first time I'd attempted to do feet. They weren't that easy to do. I had to redraw the outside of them two or three times to get those toes looking anything like toes. And I had to change the shape quite a few times to get them quite right and use the embroidery on the outside going over it to cut bits away. This daughter, she's got that sort of reddish blonde Celtic hair. Also with that goes that very pale skin, that translucent skin, which you can see veins through the very white skin that, that people have when it's like that. And I wanted to recreate this. Again, I used techniques that I'd learnt in underpainting and I tried it out and I sewed all the veins, the blue veins first and some of the dark shadows. Then I put a light colour over the top, as you would if you were painting and doing colour washes. By putting this over the top, the blue veins showed through. The second pair of feet I was much happier with, and this is my younger daughter's feet. And uh, I sat there thinking, well, how am I going to make this shape look like a foot? Sometimes you just have these days, I call them magic days, sometimes you just have these days when you, you just sail through it, you just do it. And I did these feet in, in an hour. I put in a wooden floor and the reason I put a wooden floor in there was it's a wonderful way to get an effect of perspective because you're automatically, when you draw in those planks, they're wider at the front and go narrow at the back, draw your eye back. So they were wonderful for that. But doing the wood itself was incredibly repetitive. I had to repeat the same stitches over and over again in different colours and it's an incredibly large area to fill like that. I did at the time say so I would never do a wooden floor ever again but it is such a wonderful way to be able to describe perspective that I have used it again in future pieces but usually with a rug or something like that so I haven't got such a large area to do. The most difficult thing about doing the floor was working on the sides where it stretched outwards and that did cause it to warp very, very badly and it took a lot of work to try and get that back straight. It took about two days where I had to iron it and wet it and stretch it to try and get it back into shape. Unfortunately the back where the skirting board is never did go straight again and I had to accept it as it was which was a disappointment. But I have since learned how to deal with that and I would be able to deal with that now. That's one of the great things about when you do this, you, you learn more and more all the time. The background is quite a large area to fill. It's actually 64 inches by 45 inches is the measurement of the whole quilt and it's actually half of the quilt. It's nice to have an area in something as big as this that is actually a playful area where you can create an experiment. I mixed in lots of different colours and I find often if you put similar colours next to each other it makes them very vibrant so I really enjoyed playing with them and part of what it is is to represent an aura around the girls and this aura is, is to try and express my love for them. So while I was doing this this is what I was sort of thinking about and trying to express this in a creative way. It's the reason also why the white roses are there. White roses represent love. It's symbolic and I just added that in there as part of what I was trying to describe about them. It was very warped and I had to really work hard to get it into any shape. 
So in the end, I had to make a frame of textile. And I then applied this on top of the fabric to get it straight. Otherwise, I'd never have got it straight.